briefly is what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about means, modes and medians, and you may be familiar with some of these terms already. Uh, variability, um, which is a, a slightly different concept from the, the central tendency of means, modes and medians. I'll look at one or two charts, particularly as they um, bear upon looking at things like the distribution of variables. And to, be, to end with, I'll talk about one particular kind of distribution, the normal distribution, or sometimes called the Gaussian distribution. So that's what I'm going to cover today. Okay, my approach in these sessions, in this session and those that follow, although I'm going to be looking at statistics, um, very much follows the approach of John Chukey in his book, quite an old book now, so, so many years ago he wrote it, called Exploratory Data Analysis, in which he emphasises the way in which getting a feel for the distribution of data looking at charts and diagrams particularly, gives you a feeling for what's going on and therefore uh, can be used to, as he says, to explore the data and suggest hypotheses to test. So getting some understanding of what the, the data look like before you kind of launch into using various kinds of tests. And I think that's a jolly good idea, not only because it gives you an idea of what's going on in the data, even before you've done any testing, but also because it can help you choose the right kinds of tests to do. And I'll talk about that in uh, later sessions very much, about the differences between the different kinds of, of statistical testing um, and when you should choose one and when, when another and so on. Um, Chuki actually came up with various ideas. The box plot is, is one of his inventions, but he also used the, uses the histogram, the scatter plot. Um, oh, the stem and leaf is also, I think, one of his inventions. Um, and I'll be talking about all of these, not necessarily all today. Uh, I'll come to the scatter plot next week, I think. Uh, but certainly histograms, box plots, uh, and, and so on, I'll talk about today. So that's the, the general approach I'm taking, the, the exploratory approach, getting a feel for the data, particularly by looking at it, uh, and by looking at it through the use of charts and, and one or two other mechanisms. So... Okay, so I've emphasised this idea of examining distribution. So a variable, you're now familiar with the notion of a variable, something which has a number attached to it that varies across different respondents. What's a distribution? Well, a distribution is how that variable is distributed across the, the population you're looking at or the sample you're looking at. How does it vary and what can you say about its variability and, its, and, and other aspects of it? So for, here's some typical questions you might ask about distributions. What's the average household income? And I'll come back to ideas about average in just a moment. What proportion of households? So that's a percentage or a, or a fraction of households have more than one car. What percentage of people in the UK have a degree? Again, we actually want a number in this case for a percentage of people. Um, what's the most common number of bedrooms in UK homes? Again, it's, it's a value we want from that. So some typical kind of questions which you can ask when you're looking at distributions. But just to give you some answers to those, uh, these aren't necessarily very up to date. I think the, the income one's from a couple of years ago. The average household income, the average income in a household, not of an individual, but of a household, 38,547. As I say, it might have been a couple of years ago. What proportion of households have more than one car? About two-fifths. Um, I'm not being very precise there, of course, but I could be more precise, I suppose. What percentage of people in the UK have a degree? Um, well, that's gone up remarkably over the years. A couple of figures here. 1993, it was 12% of the UK population have a degree. In 2010, it was up to 25%. It's probably just about a bit above that now. What's the most common number of bedrooms in UK homes? Three. The most common size of, of house, if you like, is that with three bedrooms. Um, of course, there are lots of others with, with smaller and, and larger, but, but that alone accounts for, for, for the largest number of houses. So these are typical questions we can ask about distributions, and what these are tending to do is ask for some kind of way of summarising all the numbers, all the values in some simple number. So at the first one, rather than asking what are all the salaries that we can get and looking at every single salary in turn, we're asking what is the average, and we're calculating that average in some fashion. And the same is true of the other things. We're getting some single number that in some way is representing the whole distribution. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this session, how to do that, the different kinds of, of ways in which you can get a judgment about that. So the problem is we want to start with 
all the numbers, uh, a large amount of data, and reduce it in some way into something that's either a single number or some kind of chart that represents that distribution in, in some more meaningful fashion, a fashion that we can understand. So we want to show the distribution of the data. Let me just start, I mean, this is a, a I'll use this data set several times in these sessions, but a, a very old data set from years ago, students in the health and illness option. And this is what data looks like. You, no doubt you're familiar with this now, you've seen SPSS, you've entered some data into it, just a small amount, of course. Um, but the file you looked at last week, the bank save data, had an awful lot of data in it. So you're familiar with this kind of spreadsheet layout. Um, the columns of variables, uh, the person's name, their gender, their age, number of GCSEs, um, and the age group at the end. Um, and, of course, each line is a respondent. If I show that to you like that, not only is it very small writing, so it's hard to see, but you get no real idea about what's going on. If I say, you know, how many males, how many females, it's hard to see. You can't see it from that diagram. So one thing we can do very quickly is a frequency count on things, in particular gender. So look back at gender. You see there are some males and some females, but you know, what, are the, what is the balance? What are the numbers? It's hard to know. So we do a simple count of those to get a frequency count. And in fact, the table below is one you might be familiar with now because it comes from SPSS. So here we're looking at things like categorical and ranked variables where we can count up the number of responses in each, in each case. So we're counting up how many males, how many females in this particular data set. And then we're displaying it on this frequency table. So this is what's known as a frequency table. The first column, of course, identifies the two uh, categories, male and female, and there's a total line at the bottom. We can see there are 34 altogether, of which 25 are female and 9 are male in this particular sample, in this particular group. The next column shows that frequency. The next column shows the percentage, uh, the percentage of, in this case, of 34. So 25 out of 34 is 73.5%. There's then a valid percentage column, which SPSS produces for you, which in most cases is the same as the percentage column if all the data are valid. It's only if you've got some answers that for some reason aren't valid, like they're missing or something like that. So if you use missing values, the 99 I talked about last week, uh, then you'll find that figure slightly different because it omits those uh, missing values from the calculation. But in this case, there weren't any missing ones, so it's exactly the same. And then lastly, we have a cumulative percentage, so that's accumulation of the first row, and then adding on the second row, and the third if there is one, and so on. Of course, there are only two rows here, so by the second row, you've got 100% of the respondents. A very simple picture of frequencies. And we can produce that for just about any variable using SPSS um, very, very quickly, a matter of clicking on a few menu options. Um, and from that, uh, uh, sorry, and, and using any variable that is categorical, as is gender, or possibly ranked. So you have something like a, a scale of some kind from one to five. You can use it on that as well and get numbers uh, uh, re replying for each, each, each uh, value in that scale. Another way of displaying the same data is a chart. Um, and here's a, 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 a pie chart, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I mean, we see all of these things all the time in newspapers and so on. And of course, it gives a very good visual indication of how that variable is distributed. You can see straight away that the, the, the blue segment is female, the green segment is male. You may not be able to read the, the logo in the, the top right, but it explains it. Um, and you can see very quickly that around about three quarters of that class were female. So the pie chart is very good at giving that kind of visual indication. Beware, by the way, don't overdo it. Sometimes pie charts aren't that useful. If you have a pie chart with lots and lots of segments on it, it's sometimes not much help at all. It, it's more confusing than it, is, um, to, to, uh, uh, than it is indicating anything. Another way of displaying things is, um, uh, sorry, going back to the frequency charts, another, another variable to display uh, on frequency charts is the, the number of GCSEs passed by each of the students in that option. Um, and again, if I go back to the data set, it's going quite hard to see that, that penultimate column. It tells us how many they, they got, but just getting a feel for what that's like over the whole group, even there's only 34 of them, is quite hard to do visually. So one way is to simply count them up. How many got one, how many got two, how many got three, and so on. And that's what frequencies does on that. 
in, in this case, of course, more possibilities <coughs> than uh, the gender, which had just male and female. We've got a total of, what is it, um, 9, 10, 11, looks like 11 different possible numbers of, of GCSEs that were um, obtained. What we get from this kind of table, though, is slightly more information than we got from the gender one. Gender was 75% roughly female, three quarters female, one quarter male. From this, we get some idea of a clumping in the middle of the range. And you can see that by looking at the percentage column. The frequency column gives you some indication of that, but of course, it's always have to be adjusted for the total number. But the percentage in each of the rows begins to give you some idea about where the common values are. And you can see, having naught or one GCSE in this class was quite uncommon. Only just under 3% had those two values each. <coughs> At the top end, having 14 GCSEs and having 13 was equally uncommon. Just under 3% again of each um, uh, got that, that, that. In fact, it's one student, as we know. That's 3%. But in the middle, the range of values with having 2, 3, 4 up to six, perhaps, it's quite a larger number. And we can see a, a, a bunching in the middle of, of, of people. And that's not uncommon in distributions, that we get relatively few at either end, and we get a large bunching of, of values in the middle. So by looking at the percentage column, you can get, begin to get some idea of what's going on there. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, because I've got some other ways of describing that bunching. And in particular, that kind of phenomenon of, of very few at the extremes and lots in the middle is something associated with a particular distribution of values that, that's useful to know about. Okay, again, you can see the value percent is the same as the actual percent because they're all valid. <coughs> Perhaps a better way of displaying this is, is some kind of visual mechanism. And the stem and leaf is, as I said, uh, developed by Chuki, is one way of showing this kind of distribution. Again, reading a table takes some time to get to grips with it. It would be nice if we could see that in some other way. And that's what a stem and leaf plot does. It's a way of writing down the numbers in a structured format so you can then see what, it, what the distribution looks like, get a feel for where most people are and where the fewer people are and so on. So the stem and leaf plot is good at showing distribution of data. It's also good at showing outliers, the ones at the extremes at either end. And also the range. Where are most people uh, in, in, in terms of the values of, of this particular variable? So let's uh, look at one. Here's one. Um, I'll obviously cut and paste it from uh, some kind of printout because of the font that's being used here. Um, and it might not seem that surprising. If you're used to bar charts, you may well know about this kind of thing now because what you're looking at actually is a bar chart on its side. So the, the numbers over here... These, these rows of numbers here are, are kind of like a bar chart on its side. So if you flipped it 90 degrees, it would be a normal upright bar chart. <clears throat> the way you do this, this is really a technique when you're doing it by hand. It's, it's a very simple technique of, of just sorting out all the data. You, you have a stem, which in this case is the numbers 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. And I stopped it there because there weren't any more. Um, and the ones indicate, or rather, let's start with the twos. The twos indicate the first two is the 20s from 20 to 24. So 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. All the values are there. The second two is the higher 20s. So it's 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Um, and then the next one, the three, is the 30, 31, and so on up to 34. And you just simply write them down. So if you come to a, a case that starts, let's say it starts at, at 26, the first number you come to, you go down to the, the second of the twos and you write down a six in that column. Um, actually, these are sorted into order, but you don't have to do that. And then you get the next one. Perhaps that was a, a, a 20. So you go to the second two and you write a zero in the column. And gradually you build up those rows of numbers as you go through each case. What that's doing is giving a visual impression of where the people are, how many people are in each kind of value. You can see again, we've got that same image that we had from the percentage chart. There's a, a bulk of people in the middle of the range here. So um, in this case, the age, and again, you might expect that. This is a class of students. Of course, most of them are going to be in their young 20s. 
Um, there was a, a few younger ones who were 19, but most were in the 20s or 21. And there were some older ones too, um, but fewer of them. So it gradually tails away to relatively small numbers at the extremes. In fact, there were two real extremes, and this is the outliers I talked about beforehand, who were down here in the... Um, there were two of them uh, who were beyond 35. I think one was 36 and one was 53. Uh, very mature students, you could say, uh, in, the, in the class. <coughs> um, and, and they're indicated by some kind of, uh, just a, an outlier in that kind of way. So stem and leaf, a, a simple way. Actually, these days, with a, a program like SPSS, it's so simple to produce a histogram there's not a lot of point in doing this, unless you haven't got the data entered into SPSS. <coughs> if you've just got a lot of manual data, uh, then this is one way of producing uh, a, a stem and leaf and, and something like a histogram to give you an idea. But once you've got the stuff into SPSS, all your data entered, there's not a great point in doing this. You might as well produce a histogram. In other words, turn it on its side and do it that way. Okay, I mentioned earlier on I was looking at central tendency, and I've already talked about that in some sense. Back to this diagram here, I've said, you know, the most of them are in the middle, in the 20s, uh, 21s, that's where most were. That's a measure of central tendency. Where does the middle of the distribution lie? Where do most people in the middle, where, whereabouts are they? And that's a measure of central tendency. And we have three particular ways of calculating that which are useful to us. The one you'll no doubt know about, the, uh, often called the average, uh, is the mean. It's the average value, and you get it by simply adding up all the numbers and dividing by the number of numbers you've got. So here's a simple example. Um, 11 Facebook users have these number of friends on their pages. What's the mean number of friends? And you do that by adding up all the numbers, so 22 plus 40 plus 53 plus 57 and so on. Um, and then dividing by the number of numbers, there are 11 numbers there, so we divide by 11. Very simple calculation, comes out at 96.64. So in this particular sample, we can say the mean number of uh, friends of these Facebook users is 96.64, or thereabouts. I mean, you might want to round that up a bit and say it, it's 96.6, um, or leave it in two different places, up to you how, how accurate you want it. But of course, there isn't actually anybody who has exactly 96.64. It's a calculation, but it gives you some idea of where the middle is. OK, so that's the mean. We use that an awful lot in, in statistics um, for all sorts of reasons. The second measure of, of central tendency is the mode. And the mode is the value that's most frequent in a distribution of values. Now, you have to be a bit careful using this, because sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, for example, you might say, you know, in a population you've got men and women, so what's the modal value? And back to my example of that health and illness class, we saw that 75% or roughly three quarters were female, so the modal value there is female. And that doesn't really tell you very much at all. What it does help with is where you have a larger range of values. So in the other examples I gave you, here if I go back to the, the charts, to... Um, perhaps the number of GCSEs, here we've got a wider range of possibilities. It makes more sense to talk about the one that's the most common uh, value, the one that has the most people doing it. Um, and you can see here, I think, on this chart, six, six GCSEs. There were... Um, oh, sorry, have I got that right? Uh, yeah, six, yeah. Six had six people. Sorry, it's confusing. Uh, there were six people that had six. That's 17.6% of the, of the whole population in that sample. Um, and that's the most frequent value. So that, in this case, is the mode of this distribution. So it gives you an idea of where the most popular value is. Okay, you can have more than one mode if you've got two values at different points which have the same number of people having that value. Perhaps we might have six GCSEs and, and perhaps eight GCSEs and the same numbers on both then you have a bimodal distribution. And in fact, you can have trimodal and so on. It's quite unusual, but, but it is possible. Um, <clears throat> what's it look like? Well, there, there's a bimodal distribution. Again, I've used a histogram here. So the, the height of the, the, the column is showing you how many, the frequency or the, the, the number of occurrences in that value. And the value is going across, just arbitrary values across the bottom here. And this might be number of GSCSEs, for example. 
Um, so you can see there are two columns of equal height. It's bimodal. Some distributions are like that, and that's a bit awkward because a lot of our stats don't work very well when we have distributions like this. So it's worth looking for it to see if you've got a, a, what you might call a dodgy distribution like this, one that isn't that, that helpful for, for doing stats. So bimodal is not, not a nice thing to get, but, but it is not uncommon. Um, what we tend to want is just one single mode, and, and you often get that as well. The third way of measuring the central, ten central tendency, where the middle of the, the range is, is called the median. And the median is the halfway value, or the value that divides everybody in that group into those above and those below with equal numbers. So at the median value, half the population in your sample have values bigger than that, and half of them have values smaller than that. And to calculate the median, you have to put everybody into order. So you have to sort all the, the, the people into order. And I've done that here using that same example of the, the Facebook friends. Um, I've, um, I've put them into order. So somebody had 22 <coughs> friends, somebody 40, somebody 53, and so on, upwards to 252. And the median is the value that divides that, that number into two equal groups. We've got 11 users here, so actually it is actually somebody in the middle. Number, what would be number six, won't it, if you count across, is the middle one. So there are five either side uh, of that person. And actually that person had 98. Remember from before, the, the mean was 96.64, wasn't it? So the median's slightly different. The median is, is a, a, the value of that middle person. If you have an odd number, sorry, if you have an even number of people, then obviously you have to get the two middling values and, and add them together and divide by two. Uh, so if, if there were actually only 10, if we knocked off the top one, then we take 93 and 98, add the two together and divide by two. And that's our median calculation. Again, the stats will produce this for you. Um, by default, all kinds of numbers like this can be produced in SPSS. Um, but it's another way of measuring the central tendency. And notice it's different. It's not the same. And sometimes that, that matters. Here's a rather complex example. I hope you can see this. Don't worry too much about the, the actual numbers and, and the, 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 the number of columns. This is a, a, a histogram showing you how many people earn different amounts of money. Um, I'm not quite sure the exact size of those columns, the groups of, of, of pay, but... As pay goes up, so this is pounds per week, starting with naught. Quite a lot of people earning nothing, but it seems on this chart. This is for the UK, does it say what year? 2008, 2009, at the bottom. Um, and it goes up from naught, 100 pounds, 200 pounds a week, 300 pounds a week, up to 1,500 pounds a week at the, the top end. This is a very common chart when you're looking at income. And it's, it's important because... I can, I can show various things about it that, it's, that you have to kind of be familiar with. The first is that the mean, the mode, and the median are all different on this chart. And I've marked them on here. So the mode is the one that has the, the highest number in that group, um, in whatever group at range of, of salaries I'm using here. But that one there, £265 uh, per week, is the, the modal value. That is the the group in this distribution that have the most people in it um, is the mode. The median is the group, that the number I said, that divides it into two equal halves, half having values below, half having values above. And the median in this case is slightly higher. It's £407 per week. So we know at 407 roughly half the population are in here, to the left-hand side, and roughly half the population but to the right-hand side over there. So it splits the population into two groups, those above, those below. And then thirdly, we have a mean, which in this case is higher again at £507. So it comes in there. And the mean, as I said, is a calculation adding up all the salaries, all the people in the sample. So it's a sample for the, is it England and Wales, something like that the whole of the population, dividing by the number of people. So whether it is 48 million or something, dividing by. Um, so it's a very big calculation, um, but it comes out at 507. Now, why are they different? Why aren't they the same? Different ways of measuring the centre of a distribution, coming out with different values. The answer has to do with the actual distribution you can see on screen here. 
And one thing to note about it, first of all, it's, it, there's a kind of a tendency in the middle. There's a kind of sense here of in the middle of, of the distribution, and that's why you're getting the mo mean and the mode you know, fairly close to each other around about here, because that's where the bulk of people are. So most people are earning this kind of range of 200 to 500 pounds a week. The second thing to notice is it's skewed. What that means is that this is not even. This side looks different from that side. That side goes off into a long tail, as it's called. It's stretched to one side, so it's skewed towards the left. The, the, the actual incomes are skewed towards the lower end, and there are relatively few people that have the very high, what you, what you might call the banker's incomes, down at the, the right-hand side, up to 1,500-plus uh, pounds a week. So very few people have high incomes, um, but there are, you know, there's a long tail off, off into very high figures that, that aren't even on this table. That last column, by the way, is a combination of all of those that have more than 1,500. So there's a lot of them, but they're all spread out in a huge range up to presumably you know, tens of thousands of pounds a week being earned. So it's a skewed distribution, and that's one reason why the mean tends to be higher than the median. And it is a matter of some debate, uh, the use of, of these figures, in things like salaries. Uh, statisticians tend to use the median as a measure of the middle because it's a skewed distribution, it's got this long tail, and therefore the median's a better way of talking about that. Others might tend to use the mean because it's higher. So if you're the government trying to persuade us that we're all earning a lot more than we thought we earned, they'll use the mean salary because it comes out higher because of that skew, because of the, the, the very high earners. So if statisticians think the median's a better figure, others may think the mean is better because it comes out higher. So when those things are different, it's often a result of the distribution across the, all the values. <laughs>